Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Juliet Palmer. I'm president of the board of the Canadian New Music Network. Originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand, I now make my home in Te Karanta, the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. CNMN brings together music and sound creators, producers, performers, educators and listeners offering resources and opportunities for mutual exchange and learning. Based in Jojaki, Montreal, on unceded indigenous land of which the Ghanaian Kahaka Nation are the recognized custodians, CNMN's membership spans the territories of the many nations of Turtle Island. Tonight, we present the second in our decolonization conversation series. We're grateful for the support of the Canadian League of Composers and the Canadian Music Centre. Our discussion tonight is led by Pamela Atariwala, curator, composer, violinist, and scholar. And I've seen her dance as well. So she's a <laughs> many, many faceted artist. So Pamela um, launched this panel with the question, can Western art music ever be equitable in practice and in perception? So I'm handing it over now to Pamela and our guests tonight, Pat Carabray, Ian Cusson, Lise Vaujois, and Dinuk Vajratne. Welcome. Thank you very much, Juliet, and hi to everyone from wherever you're joining us. So let me just first say that I think of, of all of the different types of traditional music, musicking practices that, that, are, that we see around us. I think contemporary music is the, the place where we have potential to create substantial change whether we're willing to engage equally and equitably is really the question i think and and i hope that uh maybe something fruitful will come from this this uh conversation as we learn to share the t from the table of avant-gardism so i wonder if we might start there and just talk about notions different sensibilities with regards to the concept of coloniality, col decolonization, post-colonial, and, and how, they, how they are affecting your music practice, how you think of yourself with regards to these terms. Um, Ian, would you like to have a go at that? Can you hear me? Uh, you know, uh, so many ways to go with that. Um, I think back to some conversations that I've had, particularly because a lot of the work I do is in the in the opera world, um, and and questions come up about opera as a as a form, opera as you know clearly with its roots in in Western tradition, Western musical tradition, um, theatrical tradition, and. Um, discussions around like indigenous opera what what is that or what could that be um, and uh, talking with people outside of the of the musical practice uh, often have very pejorative things to say about you know an, an, a, an indigenous subject being um, being sort of cast within the framework of Western art music um, and when I probe those questions, uh, probe, you know, what would then the, the, the perfect indigenous opera sound like? Um, they sort of uh, will often, uh, or some answers that I've heard have been, um, well, something like, for example, like the, uh, a rap sound or a, and then they'll pull all of these other kind of Western forms that have, have grown up around, um, uh, like indigenous popular music, for example. And so it's like a, we, we reject the Western art music of say, like the traditional opera, but we grab onto other Western art forms that have, have happened and grown up um, as well, like a, a country sound or um, uh, some other popular music. Um, and it, it, it's equally problematic, right? Um, and navigating what that is when I, myself exists in a body that is a mixed body. It pulls from multiple worlds and, um, and trying to navigate what an, uh, an authentic 
sound is or what a true sound is in my own work, it's a question that I feel like I'm almost every time I sit at the piano or I sit at my desk to write, I'm, I'm interrogating that question. I'm asking, what, what is this sound? Is this too Western of a sound? Is this not um, reaching to these other roots that are part of my own body? Um, and it, most of the time I'll have an intellectual uh, exercise around that. And then eventually I just kind of th feel like there's a, a, a changing point where I just throw off the shackles of those questions and say, um, what are the, what are the real base, like human connection, emotion points that I, I have with the work that I'm, I'm working on. And, um, and it pulls from all of the strands of who I am. Um, but it does it in a really messy way that probably ends up sounding to the listener as that's very Western European. Um, and so I, I, I don't know, I, I struggle with this because I, I feel like I apologize more often than not for the way my work sounds um, or feel maybe almost a sense of guilt. I don't think that's, a, that's too strong of a term for it not sounding a different way. Um, and then at the end of the day, I just kind of go, Screw it. It's, it is what it is, and it's complicated. <laughs> that's, <laughs> thank you. That's, that's interesting, because that touches upon, I think, one of our first conversations when I asked, when we were talking about whether one needs to sound like who they're supposed to represent, like who they're representing on paper. I don't know if you remember that. Um, Lise, I wonder if you'd like to reflect on your own work. <laughs> Oh, we need you to unmute, Lise. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, for me, the uh, my kind of overriding concern is less artistic and more material. In that, I I believe that we still live in a in a colonial state. Co colonization is not over. The uh, goal of controlling uh, land and resources for the purpose of resource extraction, which is the foundation of Canada, is still the foundation of Canada. It's the economic political foundation, provincial federal governments focus, that's, that's what they are facilitating most of the time, uh, which means that um, the conditions on reserves, I believe, are deliberately um, terrible in many cases. Um, and that whenever um, a, an Indigenous community stands up for its land rights, then the RCMP goes in and removes them and arrests them and so on. It's a very um, ugly, ongoing process. So um, for me, creating the ground for more people to understand the nature of what has created the kind of relationships that we have and who we understand ourselves to be is, um, is, 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 is crucial. So I see education as, as, as very, very important. But I also want to say uh, in terms of artistic production, those artistic sites, if I go back to myself, uh, uh, you know, to my, uh, when I first moved to Toronto in my early 20s, experiences with um, with Indigenous theatre, with theatre about South, South Africa, with um, anti-racist workshops, with all kinds of challenges at that time were re really crucial. So I think that those artistic opportunities are also places where we open doors to people's minds and experiences and also offer other ways of imagining ourselves in the world. Um, and, Ian, when I think of you saying almost feeling guilty, I, I, my sense is, is you use the tools. <laughs> you use the tools that are available. You, you do your best not to be stealing from somebody and using things that you have no right to use. But still, you know, you, you need to <laughs> get this idea, your ideas across and create those experiences for people. Maybe that's enough for me for the moment. Thanks, Lise. Um, how about uh, Dinook? I can't see Dinook on my screen, but 
Nick, would you like to respond to the the various ways of understanding coloniality, post-colonialism, neo-colonialism? Sure. I'll um, first of all thank you so much for for having me. It's a it's a real privilege to be here, and um, I'd love to springboard off something uh, Ian talked about, which is this notion of having multiple identities. Uh, I think what I've discovered through music is, you know, we all have multiple identities. They need not be cultural identities per se, but in my case, you know, I'm talking about multiple cu cultural identities. But I think what we discover is that we're trying to reconcile many different facets of ourselves, uh, be they cultural or other kinds of identities. And um, in, in my case, um, I've been on a journey where I've used my music to deliberately reconcile identities which uh, have to coexist. And um, if I didn't have music, I, I think they would be sort of quite uncomfortable. So an example of this is, you know, not feeling myself um, fully, fully Eastern or fully Western. You know, it's just the, the way this lifetime has gone. Um, you know, I was born in Asia and I grew up in the Middle East and then I moved to the West and I received, I received a, um, an exclusively Western training in an Asian country. So that already created this kind of dichotomy. And, um, and you know, we all have our experiences uh, in trying to be who we are in the classical music industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I should, I should say up front that my experience has been fortunate in the sense that I, I wouldn't say that I've been obstructed in terms of any kind of racial discrimination in my work, at least not to my face, right? So it's not happened to my face. If I've missed out on opportunities because of my race, then, you know, it certainly happened behind my back. Um, so, uh, uh, but that said, I think um, certainly when I was at a very, very formative stage and I remember I was an undergrad in the UK and it was just this point when I was really kind of reaching into my heritage and trying to find room for that in my music. Um, I think as, as, as wonderful as everyone was around me, I think if I wanted any kind of nuanced guidance as to how to do that and how to find a place for myself, it, it probably wouldn't have been there, you know. Um, the, the support would have been there. I think people would have encouraged me, but in terms of finding a way to just really making that process happen, it, it might not have been there. And, and so now years later, um, having produced pieces that, that you know, um, balance all of these elements, uh, having, having used this music to discover more about myself and about the contradictions and everything, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, at the moment I'm fully freelance. I'm not attached to any institution. I'm just one guy creating music and, and really just interacting with people. I interact with a lot of people, but just one-on-one. -on -one. So what I just try to do is, um, you know, empower the next person to believe, I hope, that this medium that we have is a blank enough canvas for, our, for us to tell our story. Right. So I, I believe that is true. So one example is, you know, if, if someone asks me to write a piece for, for orchestra, I, I see it as a blank canvas, you know. Um, I mean, I, you know, certainly no one in my circle would dare tell me that it's, it's I can't tell my story using this very Western medium. But, um, or maybe I'm quietly stubborn, but I just think it's a blank canvas. I have my own background. I'm going to tell my story. And um, I, I think, you know, what we can do is uh, just create infrastructures that would help people empower them to believe that this medium can, you know, they can also use this medium to tell their story as multifaceted as it is. We're not quite there yet, you know, we have a long way to go um, and uh, people need to see themselves on stage. Uh, uh, you know, aspiring artists. Ideally, I think, you know, if you have a multicultural city, uh, 
everyone you see on stage should be a reflection of everyone in the audience. You know, there should be, everything should be equal. The opportunities should be equal. Um, but uh, yeah, just, just to finish, you know, I, I do like to try and tell people uh, on a sort of one-to-one -one basis, you know, if you're feeling um, like there isn't room, there should be, and you should seize it, you know, because um, this is certainly the time. It's not, it's, you know, not, we're not necessarily battling with um, the huge forces that might have been against us a generation and a generation before that. I think things are, we're in a better situation, but there's still uh, a long way to go in terms of just making sure everyone is heard. Thank you, Dinuk. And um, I just want to, to add something before turning to Pat um, with regards to the orchestras, the blank, blank canvas. And I know you've spoken about this before and about people being reflected on the stage. Um, so if we take orchestras as an example, when we were looking to, for the Orchestras Canada diversity report, when we were looking at who we might speak to amongst the, the the musicians themselves, as opposed to the administrators. Um, it was very interesting that we found amongst rank and file musicians, there were very few, so, I'm, and we, we chose to exclude East Asians, so people from China, Japan, Korea, because they were pretty well represented and have been since the 70s. But we, when we looked at the rank and file players, um, of South Asian, African, near, near and West Asian, um, sort of West and Central Asian uh, origins, we found there were less than 20 across the country. And this is really, really interesting. And that's amongst rank and file. And yet when one is looking at the soloists, then there actually are a lot more, the people that, that you put in the front of the stage. And so I've always wondered what that is about. And, and orchestra administrators kept saying, well, there's, you know, you people of color, you're not in the pipeline, you're obviously not good enough or something. They, they didn't really know how to articulate what that was. Um, and, and I, you know, my own work has focused on, on what is the relationship between the multicultural imperative to represent oneself and how does that actually keep, keep people of certain backgrounds away from wanting to engage at, at a level that would get them into that rank and file position. So what keeps them away from wanting to engage in Western art music in that, in that way, that it's the job that you become part of that cog in the wheel of producing, as opposed to being the person on the front who's displaying, if that makes sense. Yes, that's, that's a very interesting thing. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm currently not affiliated with an organization at the, uh, at the moment, but in terms of interacting with, with people one-on-one, -on -one, there is a lot of trepidation about, um, but, you know, I, I'm talking about young artists pursuing um, a path where you don't see many people like yourself, right? Um, and so, so I think at the infrastructural level, there is there is something that causes people to feel a bit trepidatious and. Um, and, and, you know, worse, I mean, I think the saddest thing for an artist is not to be authentic or not to feel like they can have the freedom to be authentic. So the, the question we should be asking is, do these systems truly em um, empathize with and empower people to be authentic artists? Do they, do they just, you know, you have to give them access and a feeling of freedom. And that leads, leads us beautifully into uh, Pat Carberry, who is our systems person. Um, and, and Pat, um, I don't know if I mentioned it in, in my introduction. So, so Pat and I, I think when I was in Brandon in 2017, Pat had recently discovered that his, uh, he is of Métis ancestry. So he's gone through an interesting journey and having gone through life to this point as, as a part of the dominant culture, or at least passing as that, and uh, you know, and having those the privileges that come with that, and now being Métis, 
<laughs> so Pat, over to you. I wonder, I mean, there's a lot that you could expound upon, but. Uh... Yeah, I guess I can say uh, hooray for DNA tests. <laughs> so it was the way that I connected with my birth family, uh, which was, has been an interesting journey for me. But as I think about this, a, lo a lot of what I've been thinking about related to the, this part of what we're talking about has really developed since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report came out. And we're at this very interesting stage of truth. We're nowhere near reconciliation, but we're at the discovery of truth because what we, we have all been sold a very large number of lies and untruths, you know, like the history as we have been taught it of Canada and of the world is in fact nowhere near what the real history of the world is. And, and we're just, I, I see it scratching its way out every once in a while as we find a new tidbit. You know, the, the reality is that what we've been told was crafted by white males to reinforce their position in the world and their dominance. And they've very carefully ignored many things that have happened that were rich parts of our history. And it's, it's not even just that, like in Western music, when I came to UBC, someone said, oh, they do German music at UBC. They don't even think about French music, Never mind, you know? And, and I went, oh no, come on, it's, it's not true. We do lots of different kinds of music here, but there is, the, is this perception that for example, music theory is heavily dominated by Germanic theory, you know, to the exclusion of how chords were treated and vocabularies developed in, in many other parts of Europe. And, and that's just because they wrote the books, you know, and, and we're finding the same thing about our Canadian history. I've been spending quite a bit of time with Jean Taillet's book about the history of Red River and the Métis people. And when you read it, it's so frightening and no wonder my culture hid and passed when we could because it was there was a lot of violence done to us in in that area and canada has that history of violence well i know a lot of people have been reading um, dylan robinson's book and now i've had to think about epistemic violence like people using the truth to do violence and keep other things out of discussion and and suppressed so I think we're at this interesting stage where music is behind. When I go out into the larger university community, a, a lot of these issues have moved forward over the last decade in ways that I can only hope that we'll be able to achieve in music. But I can see a lot of people, at least we're, we have the discussion open to us now. And I think that if you look at the richness of musical practice around the world, then there's room for all of us. And it's really decolonization is about making room for alternate truths that are truths. There's more than one truth. And coming to grips with that, I think, is a challenge for a lot of us who were told that there was one truth, whatever that one truth was. That's, yeah, very important point and you know, I I didn't mention that uh, um, so what part of my reason in coming to speaking of authenticity and my own personal desire to be to have the freedom to be a little bit more authentic um, in in what I could produce is that so I spent 25 years in Toronto after growing up in Calgary um, and then living in various parts of the world for, for a, a decade. Um, but after 25 years in Toronto, I kept feeling, feeling like people wanted to pigeonhole me into being a certain kind of person and actually to, to represent um, a certain kind of being Indian, like East Indian, which felt very untrue to me. So for me coming to this part of the world, to the west coast of Canada, to the land of the, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Coast Salish peoples, I wanted to come back to where my grandparents had landed. And in even doing these kind of land acknowledgements, I wish I could say to the, the part of the country where, where the Musqueam, the Coast Salish, and the Tsleil-Waututh 
welcomed my grandparents, but I have no idea that they actually welcomed them or not. I don't know. It was over a hundred years ago. I know that there were, my grandmother has a lot of stories and my mother has stories, but I, I don't know about the welcoming. Nevertheless, I'm part of, you know, the other musical part of my wanting to be here is that there's, there's a, a capacity. So there's a, there are the people of South Asian descent out here had been here for multiple generations. And India is a foreign country to us. You know, it's a multi-generational foreign <laughs> country. Um, so I just wanted to, to add that. Um, now, Lisa, there's something else that you, there's one of the things, aspects of your, your dissertation that I found really, really interesting was this notion of, um, let me find your, the term. Actually, it ties into what Pat was just talking about, about decolonization and, and truth. And you talked about the innocence that the musical, let's, you wrote, the music education practices cannot be politically innocent. And that, that we, as the, the musicians, and, and perhaps you're speaking a little bit more of, of those of us who came from performance where we don't necessarily critically think about what we do. We just, you know, go into practice room, you gotta learn your excerpts, you have to learn your, whatever you need to get, to get into a, an audition. Um, and, and that we're then in a, um, kind of a, then a position of obedience. And you called it a terminal naivete. I love that. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. A lot of uh, performance practice is about discipline and obedience and uh, learning how to replicate uh, a canon, the, the Western canon. Um, and at no point do we ever ask, <laughs> have, have any space to think about um, what it means, what we're doing, what kind of meanings we're putting out into the world. Um, no, I lost my train there, sorry. Um, let me just pause and think for a second. We, yeah, so I also studied a lot of uh, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, who's, who's really thinking a lot about power and that discipline, uh, the more disciplined one is um, and obedient to a certain uh, framework, the less capacity one has for political agency. Uh, and that is what I have found, um, that there was no space to have these conversations uh, as a performer. So I was a French horn player for a very long time. I played in a small ensemble. We would be, we had many arguments about the repertoire we were doing. Um, and really, I was the bad guy because I was making everything political. When in fact, every decision about repertoire has, has political cultural significance. And the invention of culture is something that comes out of the whole colonial project. We don't even have a concept of culture um, as something that distinguishes people from each other uh, until quite, quite late, I'm um, thinking 19th century, maybe a little earlier than that. Um, so we don't really, uh, as I say, we, we are trained in obedience and that terminal naivety also means that we are un not only unable to look after ourselves when the funding disappears, um, and when we start to advocate for funding, we don't actually have a concept of what kind of economy we're in and the fact that we exist within an economy of structured scarcity so that we wind up competing each against each other for uh, inadequate resources and um, again, wind up then in these very small picture disputes and don't have the space to ask ourselves questions about what is the larger structure here? Why is it that there is not enough to go around? Why is it that we're in a class-based society? Why is it that there are people who live on reservations in the first place? What is that about? How did that come to be? And what is, what is our relationship with that? So that term, idea of terminal naivety uh, is, suggests that it is, it's an illness in a way. It's a, a disadvantage to each and every one of us not to understand um, 
the significance of the kind of work that we do. Does anyone want to jump in in response to that? I'll just say that, that this is something that uh, I've been having conversations with players, like the rank and file players in orchestras, um, particularly through Oxum, which is the Organization of Canadian Symphony Musicians. And an increasing number of them are pushing back and asking for to have more agency within their organizations. Um, a lot of them are concerned, especially out in Alberta, about where where the private donorships are coming from and and the you know the ethical questions about being funded by money from Fort Mac. Um, so so maybe here's a question to go back to Pat for a second. You know, how, how can we change the conversation amongst students coming up through the system? The, those who are going to be the performers, the, the rank and file, the people who will play in and Danuk's music. Well, that's a that's a big question. I th I think I think we're in this process of you know when I when I attend heads directors deans meetings across the country, uh, decolonization, inclusivity, diversity are very very high on the administrative agenda everywhere, um, but. Educational institutions are notoriously slow to evolve. Uh, so, you know, you, you can look at the McGill website and see that they have already come up with a diversity statement and a bit of an action plan that they're going to use their invited guest lecture money to only bring in people who aren't represented by their current faculty. You know, so they're going to try and, and identify the gaps and holes and, and bring that in. Um, I'm teaching a course this semester with David Metzer on, on uh, indigenous sonic knowledge, you know, and, and looking at how indigenous culture might represent sound in various forms and, and the role that that plays. And that, that allows us to springboard into discussions about sovereignty, sonic sovereignty, who controls sound, how is it uh, managed, you know, who gets to do what. Um, and, you know, and this is a challenge in, in I, I think, all cultures, particularly the conversation in Indigenous cultures in the last little while has been the difference between understanding the difference between hereditary leaders and elected leaders, because elected leaders have a political agenda in relationship to the state that makes them work in certain ways, whereas hereditary elders, and not all parts of the country have hereditary elders, um, even just in our need as a Western society to identify one word that captures all, you know, indigenous people. There's hundreds of different peoples with completely different traditions and laws and uh, ways of being that we want to pigeonhole, we want a word for it, you know. So I, I think the challenge for us is to accept diversity and and the implications that has for all the things that we do because it, it was interesting I came here uh, to UBC about a year and a half ago and one of the first things that hit me was and it's a little bit corny but they they have a little post on the website that says don't use the golden rule you know which was to treat others the way you would like to be treated it's go one step further you want to treat people the way they want to be treated so it's a completely different way of thinking you know, so again, in, and in my mind, this applies to my audience, you know, the musicians I work with, all kinds of the decisions I'm making for how I'm going to interact with things. So the, you know, it's really a, a very thought provoking process. But I think the great thing about modern culture is that in, in a sense, it's an empty vessel that we that has been filled up one way we can we can refill it you know we can empty some things out and and refill and rebalance i i think it's you know like our orchestras are in theory living things that are incorporated with a with with laws and bylaws that can be readjusted 
So just because they were created one way doesn't mean they have to stay that way. And just look at what happens to any orchestra when the artistic director changes. You know, you, a whole section of the artistic direction of the organization can shift. The uh, new manager comes in, new concert master. I mean, I've seen many orchestras, like when I started working with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, it was, was just coming out of a very gray period where a lot of retirements were happening. We had a whole bunch of young musicians come in and the whole culture of the organization changes in what they're willing to do and what they're willing to try. So I, I, I think that we're going through this process and we should just not be afraid to keep pushing. If I can add, um, it's, you know, I, I love this idea and I think uh, Dinuk and Pat have both said this tonight that of, of Western art music as almost being a vessel. It's like a container that, that can hold many things. Um, it can hold what it has traditionally held, but it can hold um, whether it be cultural diversity, sonic diversity, whatever it might be, um, and that it's this flexible package. And I think that's so, so true and, and that, that it's a set of tools that are available to everyone. And that's where it gets tricky because they're not really available to everyone. Um, and then there's this whole question, and I think it comes back to education and pathways, both for the performer, but also for the, for the composer. Um, how does one enter into this very uh, particular world, even though it is a, like a vessel, the vessel has a, a solid found structure to it. And um, how does one navigate that? Um, you know, you could say, oh, I just want to write a work for an orchestra, but um, what are the the pieces that you need to to know or have under you to be able to do that thing. So I, I think a lot about in my own work um, and just about communities like re more remote communities um, in 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 this country that don't have access to say um, music schools or the funds to be able to uh, to um, to learn how to orchestrate or learn what the the parameters of of this vessel is of Western art music, and places of access, um, and 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 how we can be bridging that say in, in the the youngest people's lives before they get to post secondary um, places or um, you know doing graduate degrees and that sort of thing. Um, I have a kind of interesting story in all of this in that I unlike all of you here on this on this uh, chat. I charted a very different path uh, into this world, um, but while taking private lessons, I never did a, any advanced degrees um, in, in music, uh, besides just a little bit of pro uh, study um, post-secondary as a, a pianist. Um, it was all either private study or um, completely outside of, the, uh, of, of institutions. Um, and yet it was super institutional because all of my private people of study or people that I studied with were trained in that form or in that structure. The books that I've read and um, the people I've listened to have all kind of come within that structure. So I guess I'm very interested in how we create new pathways for people that don't have uh, the access or um, the means to, to, um, to do advanced degrees or whatever it might be and learn these tools. Yeah. If I could jump in, um, thanks, Ian. You know, I, I, I think um, as we go through these systems, the people who, um, you know, we're, we're at very impressionable stages and the, and the people who uh, inspire us, you know, conversely, it only takes um, a misplaced comment or something. And the comment might not be malicious, but it could be just ignorance in terms of uh, you know, the subtext being there might not be place for your story in whatever project this is, you know. Um, and when you're, when you're at a very formative stage, you know, it, it only takes one comment for that to make a big impression on a young artist. And then one has to go through a process where you just realize that that, that comment was misplaced, you know. And in that time, you've lost a sense of authenticity and you've lost some kind of urgency in in really wanting to find a way to uh, express yourself, you know, through this medium. And, um, uh, but, you know, like I, you know, whether you use the, 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 the metaphor of the uh, blank canvas or the empty vessel, um, I, I do hope that people can be sort of acculturated to think that way, 
but we also have to be aware of the fact that it has been skewed for so long, you know. Um, so ultimately, you know, what will our programming look like in 10 years time, 20 years time, 50 years time? Is it more, is it more sort of uh, widely spread? I think that'll be the big question. Um, you know, I, I, I love this image of, of Western art music as, as the vessel. What I have been curious about for a while, and, and I don't, I'm quite sure I'm not the only person thinking about this, is the fact that the, the tools within that vessel have remained quite static over the last, say, century and a half. You know, it's, it's still ideally 20 first violins and, you know, 16 or 18 seconds. You know, it's violins, violas, you have your string section, your brass and your winds and, and percussion and actually where things tend to change or have changed over the last hundred years have been within the percussion section. But the rest of the sections are really, have been quite static. And uh, what do you see as the possibilities of other instruments of people, you know, coming from different ethnocultural backgrounds, but even you know, amongst the various indigenous populations in Canada, bringing their instruments into this orchestral model. Or, and, and I mean, we're talking about orchestras right now, but also even into the, this, this is contemporary new music. So within this idea of composed music or kind of the, the Western way, way of putting a lot of people together in a space and creating something new. Can I, can I, can I jump in actually? Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny you should bring that up because I, you know, all through my life I've had um, um, uh, these fun kind of thought experiments with myself. And um, I think this was just, just came from being exposed to music making in different cultures while receiving a Western education and while you know, just spending all of my pocket money on Mozart and Beethoven scores and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I, you know, I, one of the thought experiments was um, if you take a staple of the repertoire, like Brahms II, which relies on notation, printed notation that we've used for hundreds of years, um, how, what would this look like if we were passing down a great piece of music using oral traditions, you know? Uh, sort of like sort of um, uh, guru student traditions where you just you recite a composition and then it's up to someone to just remember that and pass it on right you would have a tradition where great pieces of music were handed down in this way and they they would sound just so utterly different you know and people wouldn't be able to exert a certain control so that was one experiment another experiment is is your orchestra, as you say, has not changed since you could argue the beginning of, of it being a business model in, in the late 1800s or something, right? It's kind of curious that if you look at this, this instrument, it had a huge explosion of, of growth and creativity and innovation from say Monteverdi to Mahler. And then it's been the same uh, for the hundred years after that, right? When, um, in science, tech, and business. There have been huge innovations in terms of what the products are and everything, but our product hasn't changed. So I think, uh, I think you know, to survive as a classical musician and working in different, uh, with different instruments, the orchestra being one of them, but then you might work, you, you know, move on to chamber music or sort of like ensembles where you have electronics and everything. You experience a certain kind of frustration because certain models have not changed. And uh, the, the kind of gradient of creativity and innovation hasn't been all encompassing, you know, the way you see it in, in, in technology, right? Um, and uh, I, I think that's why it's very, very important to challenge tradition. Like uh, these are the discussions we should be having. We shouldn't ignore the fact that there has been um, some kind of stasis uh, if you know what I mean. Um, if I could jump in, I think one of the interesting things, I've done a lot of work with the Canada Council over my career, and, and from a policy standpoint, there's almost 
there's very little justification for funding the orchestras the way they are to play Beethoven. They're funded as, as a cultural component of Canada, infrastructure to keep musicians in the community, so that music education and a, a variety of other things, the music of Canadian composers connecting in a variety of ways. And I think, you know, the, the orchestras are slow to catch on to their real role and why they're getting funding. And I, I don't think the council has pushed as hard as it, it could on that front, but I find most interesting if we look at the early music groups across the country, the changes there, because they have to work even harder to justify their existence. And if I look at the bank, uh, early music Vancouver uh, changes in the last little while, they've done concerts of, of Bach, they've done Chopin on original instruments, they've done music of the Tang Dynasty on traditional instruments, they've done Persian court music, from, you know, historical court music, because they've taken it to heart. What is their role? To look at historical music from the world. And now all of a sudden we see our stages populated by a completely different combination of instruments. So I think that there's a lot of room to find good pathways um, and, and for me, I look at what's going on in Saskatchewan of all places to see orchestras becoming really relevant in their communities. And, and I, I think there are good options that allow for more diversity, for more experimentation, for more connecting to the community to, so that the whole community can see itself reflected in an artistic institution if they so wish. And I think that's the challenge for a lot of indigenous communities it's food and water and basic things that need to be sorted out before they're asked to come and do something on a stage like this. So, you know, we have so many different things depending on where we are in our positionality. But I think there's room. And, you know, this is something that we, we concluded when it, with the Orchestras Canada report is that uh, orchestras especially are not, um, and, and it goes also to the, the, the larger training institutions, post-secondary training institutions that, that train orchestral musicians and performers. But in Canada, we're in a tricky spot because the arts councils are really asking orchestras and musicians to be a lot more local, to represent Canada, to represent the communities, and, and to really be present and engaged with community partly because they've been funded to the extent that they have as such that musicians working the Western art music tradition are, are feasibly and will disregard um, um, commercial music for, for the moment, but they're really the only musicians who can, who can earn a living wage in the cur current system. Um, so the arts councils are asking them to be more uh, local and yet the structure is an internationalist structure. So, you know, if we're trying to recruit students from, from Europe or from the United States, or alternately, you know, send, be able to have our students then go to other countries and play, there's a certain, you know, there's this expectation of international caliber and quality that we want to have, but then that's also a very limiting thing for being responsive to the, 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 the local. So that's, and, you know, it's finding that balance of really where we need to be. And that's, that's why I keep talking about, you know, what is Canadian music? What's the future of the Canadian um, within the music system? Please, uh, I wonder if you have anything you'd like to contribute for. <laughs> I, uh, I always struggle. I struggle with the whole concept of Canada and Canadian music. You know, what is Canadian culture? I see uh, people making music, um, but what what I will say is I, I you know what I, I, I see happening uh, with in in uh, popular art forms, popular music, um, where communities are you know kids in communities then are making their own music and filming it, so they create a new song, they film it, and then it's out on on YouTube. Um, and I think those things are incredibly important and empowering for uh, for those students. I see other people in the popular world doing things. I think of uh, Buffy St. Marie's, uh, Tanya Takak's piece. I think it's, um, we gotta run, something like that. 
um, which to me is really directed again at young people and young people who are really struggling with with suicidal feelings. Um, so I, I do struggle with with bringing the our different worlds together because I think that there's a whole range of challenges and problems. Um, and you know, you in your in your report, uh, Parmela, you also touched on class and class relations. And when we are thinking about who has the opportunity to learn these instruments to become artists in this particular art form, um, I recall visiting a, 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 during a social justice and music at music conference in Toronto, um, visiting a place called Sketch for. Um, homeless and street involved youth. I see uh, Ian nodding his head, so you you know what that is. And when we went there, we went and visited the music studio. And with one exception, the group of us educated, university educated musicians, uh, some performers and then educators as well, did not have a single one of the skills that, uh, that the musician in this studio was offering to these uh, young people who wanted to create their own music. It was very different from what we had been educated to do. Um, so I don't think what I'm saying is kind of solving this this uh, dilemma of the orchestral world, but I, I think that it needs to be part of the, the mix and what we're thinking about and who who we're thinking about. Are we creating a situation where some more people get to be part of the middle class and be part of the artistic uh, milieu that is accessible to the middle class? Um, are we break, finding ways to actually break that down as well? Yeah, I, I, I'd love to see these like this whole idea of like um, high art, low art, all that garbage really flatten um and and thinking of like of the i mean this we love we're all here because we love uh what we have experienced um within western art music and you know i think of just the power of this this work and how does it then connect to communities I, i'm you know living just outside of toronto but i think of a huge diversity um of people living in that city and how many uh, feel like they can go to the Four Seasons Center and watch an opera at the Canadian Opera Company? Um, not many. Uh, and when you walk into that space, it, it's an extremely white space. And it's very well-off people that are having their hoity-toity evening. Um, and that's really troubling. And I think, you know, there, there are these great works on the stage. And I think there can be great works that are relevant to today on that stage as well. Uh, that would that need to be able to connect with a whole range of people and so how that works that's a huge question in terms of access and in terms of connecting with communities but I think I would love to see our large arts organizations especially having far far deeper engagement within a whole swath of communities uh, that are that are around them and not just a very uh, small set of people that have incredible means to be able to go to these very expensive evenings. Um, one of my my last acts, I guess, of, of defiance when I left Toronto was that I had the opportunity to speak with the Toronto City Council and those working in the culture department. And um, so the, the the five big institutions, arts institutions in in Toronto, including the Toronto Symphony the Canadian Opera Company and the National Ballet, all of whom I have worked for at various points in my life, um, they are, they receive their, their local funding from, not from the Toronto Arts Council, but from the city itself. And so they, you know, they, those who are sitting on the Arts Council, the, the supposed peers can't affect their funding. But I said to the city, I said, if one of the city's main criteria or criterion is is affecting change uh, across um, the socioeconomically problematic neighborhoods, not problematic, but, but deprived, um, then why is it that Toronto Symphony, for example, can be the orchestra of the Regent Park 
area, but the musicians themselves had nothing to do with the Regent Park School of Music. And so, yes, um, I mean, Lise, you were talking about the, you know, the skills of, of being able to, to work with musicians on their level, like the young people on their level. And I was so, I taught at Regent Park School of Music and that was what the kids wanted to do. They wanted to create popular music and hear you know, I'm a classically trained violinist and I, you know, I had to, to acquire the chops to do that. But, but I, I just think if those symphony musicians were actually in that school and dealing with those kids, then they would start to understand that, that local need and um, can create those relationships that I think we need to, and to really then build trust amongst the communities. And somebody here, um, Roxanne had used the word globalization. Yes which is it's a, one of the words that ethnomusicologists like, the local and the global at the same time, and how they interact. just want to pull up something that um, Joseph Glazer has written here in the chat with regards to the blank page of classical music. And he, he says, can we really dismiss the colonial hierarchical nature built into the institution of the orchestra and conservatory university training? Doesn't the page already have a lot or have a lot already written on it. Um, here's something else I wanted to, to bring into today, today's discussion and that has to do with when we bring others from outside of the conservatory and the university um, background into whether it's contemporary music or the orchestra, you know, however, the, whatever kind of structure it is. But the Western art music structure. What do we do about, and Pat, you and I have talked about this, the notion of ownership of the new work when it's a collaborative work, because that's the other thing that's built into our system. It's that notion of single authorship, which also, you know, it, it, that permeates post-secondary studies as well. You know, my dissertation is mine, but really it's also belongs to all of the people that I interviewed. So there's just this notion of, is there a way to reconfigure so that collaborative works become co-authored works? And how do we deal with copyright and ownership and you know, all those things? Yeah, I, th I think, th I mean, these are, these are really important questions. And I mean, having worked with a, a symphony orchestra for six seasons, I mean, the, the, the biggest challenge are all the legal agreements that you work under whether that's copyright or union agreements or contracts with the physical spaces that you do things in. Um, and they're all around ownership, you know, which is a concept that's really dominant in, in Western culture. And so I, I think, you know, it, a lot of the history of new music in, in the last hundred years has been about going against all those things, you know, taking, things that belong to other people and doing things to them where, you know, Marshall Duchamp, Duchamp you know, and, and the, the whole uh, I, idea of improvisation and group collective activities. I think, you know, the big challenge for us is we're going to make our lives a lot more complicated. It will be harder to write music. I'm having a hard time right now trying to figure out what do I own? How do I create a piece that I don't try and control other people completely? You know, it's, it's a real rethink of how I interact with other musicians. And yeah, our institutions are really slow and not agile at, at tilting towards these new things or reorienting themselves. But I think it will happen because students want it, musicians want it. Uh, you know, yeah, there's a few musicians who just want to go do what they're told, but there's a lot of creativity that I see in my students that I interact with all the time and, and they're willing to try all kinds of things. They're asking all kinds of questions. And I think we just have to stop limiting those discussions and have more opportunities like this to challenge ourselves. And you know, that's, that's, Sorry, I just I just wanted to quickly say it's a really good point that, that about the students and, and the University of Toronto students who who complained about the offerings at the University of Toronto. Go ahead, Dinuk. Oh, sorry. And I, I just wanted to try and answer Joseph's question. I know Joseph. So hi, Joseph. Uh, thanks for being here. 
Um, you know, my answer is no, we don't have to throw anything out. But, uh, in, you know, when we talk about the colonial origins of this art form, I think people just need to be aware going forwards how the deck has been stacked, right? Um, and, uh, you know, as Pat said, you know, we've, we've seen one truth, but there are many truths. And going forwards, it'll take a very long time because what you're talking about is you're trying to change the awareness of people across generations. And that will change if there's a very gentle and consistent effort and force. But of course, we have to be patient because it takes time. So it, you're, you're, what you're trying to do very painstakingly over time is change the awareness of people that the deck has, you know, it, it, it's sort of leaning one way. And, and the bulk of what we're playing is, you know, music by dead white European males, and that's what kind of sells the tickets. But now we have the space to introduce new stuff and, and hopefully equalize the balance. So it's, it's not a case of throwing anything out per se, um, but, but, you know, how can we redistribute and um, how can the proportions change? And I'd add to that, yeah, I think we're going to see the, the flexibility and the malleability in the smaller organizations. I think it makes sense to all of us to think, you know, if you're, you're usually more lithe and flexible when you're a smaller um, group. I think of, of orchestras and, and, you know, like you said, Parmela, that there's uh, the rank and file musicians are some of the only um, uh, people that are able to make a, a living in this country as professional musicians. Um, and, and, and part of the challenge there when you want to challenge uh, configurations, for example. So if somebody asks me to write a work for, for an orchestra, they'll, they'll, we'll then start to say, well, what instruments can I use? And they'll say, well, our core instruments are such, or we've already planned the programming for the rest of the concert. So you actually have to work within the exact limits of this. And that, that I'm sure we all have funny stories of negotiations around, can I please get this one additional instrument? And oftentimes they come back to you and say, it's not in the budget. And so, and, and, and of course you're dealing with extremely limited uh, resources in terms of rehearsal time. So um, we're gonna try this radically different thing is often just not feasible because there's, so there are so many structural issues there. So if I were to say, I wanna have, you know, Eastern, Western, these cultures all coming together and I only need six of your core instruments in the orchestra for this performance. They're gonna say, well, they're all contracted to pay. They all need to make a living. And so there, there are so many issues there. I wanted to, to just touch um, on contracts because I, in terms of, there's of course the issue of ownership uh, as we've discussed a little bit and, um, and, and what happens when there are multiple players or, or composers or people um, creating a work or if there's imp major improvised sections. I think that's a really important question. But I think just the nature of, um, of contracts uh, and thinking about a, a more de decolonized model um, one thing that I've, I've observed is uh, the one-sided nature of contracts. Uh, they so, so rarely have a, a sense of reciprocity in the language, that we are two partners coming together, more like in, in the treaties that we see. We're coming together to share in this creative work. That's not how they often look, especially in a, a commission contract. It's often we, this large organization, have had multiple lawyers construct said thing to protect our interests. And you will come and sign this um, and here are the things you sort of can't do. Uh, or the, here are the protections that we have not built in this contract, in this boilerplate contract. And trying to change those agreements, as I've tried many times, is extremely difficult and is often met with well, if we change the language in this contract with you, um, we'll have to hire all the lawyers back and then we won't have the money to pay people like you who are the composers. Um, it, it, it's very frustrating, but I think I would love to see um, just the nature of entering these agreements look more like uh, treaties. Uh, and there are some really exciting artists, not in the in the music world. I can think of uh, Kim Harvey on the West Coast, who's doing these kind of uh, treaty agreements with uh, theater commissions. And I, I'd love to see that the sense of we're we are equals and we're coming together to do this work uh, as equals, not as giant 
uh, organization and you, this individual person over here. I think that's, you know, I love that. It, uh, sorry, Pamela, I think, uh, Ian, what you say is fascinating. You know, the, the, the fact that it's such a Herculean task to change the contracts. It's a little embarrassing for us that, that that's an example of how creativity and innovation um, gets stuck in this industry. Because, you know, like, I mean, I know that my next iPhone is going to be a step up from the previous one, right? But I have less confidence in some of these models evolving. So it's, I think that's an, what Ian was talking about is, is, a, is a sad example of how there's a sort of inflexibility which is um, still holding us back. Um, I'd, I'd love to keep going with this idea. I, I, I love that idea of treaties. Um, and and to, I have to say in the, the few opportunities that I've had recently to speak with students, I, one of the things I try to appeal to is, is their own sense, well, not students, but also uh, orchestral players, is their sense, personal sense of ethics and and thinking about equity according to your own personal ethics and that what kind of relationship do you want to have with your neighbor or your your friend or you you know um but i do want to look at some of the questions that are in the chat um so oh perhaps pat you've answered this how can we address decolonization in western music when institutions still blatantly favor bodies and knowledge that conform to western ideologies um, and also, there's a two-parter here. There are quite a few Indigenous composers and musicians who have been walking this path for several decades now, but they are continuously erased or excluded because they are racialized or challenge the status quo. How do these people gain the same benefits, privileges as those who come from privileged positions with white and white adjacent bodies? Oh, that's a big one. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is so true. Um, Lise, I wonder if I can turn that one over to you. You're cruel sometimes, Parmela, <laughs> because I, I don't think, I'm not sure it's an easy, there is an answer. Uh, no, it's, I, I only give it to you because I know you've been thinking about this for a long, long time. Well, and, and privilege doesn't come with uh, out lack of privilege. Right. There's no such thing as simply earning privileges and um, nobody being very deliberately left behind in the process. Uh, so I'm not a believer in, you know, lifting people, lifting themselves up by their bootstraps. I think that we have a structure that is designed to have uh, people oppressed for very specific political reasons. And we have a structure that's designed to um, have, you know, use many racialized bodies for low-waged labor and precarious labor, right, including refugees and, and populations that are migrating around the world in very precarious conditions. So I can't argue that we all want to have the same privileges. I would like us all to have access to a healthy means of living well. Um, and if that means some people don't have as much as uh, which we see lots of excess, not necessarily amongst classical musicians. Um, but so, so I would want to frame that frame that a bit differently with without dismissing the idea that people are not getting the recognition that they deserve. Um, Pat, Pat, is there anything you might want to add to that? Yeah, I guess, I mean, at one level, it will really, I mean, I think we're at a, a signal opportunity here where we can ask a lot of questions about the monetary system that supports what, what we do. I mean, we're, we're at a kind of broken time, right? The, the old infrastructure for royalties isn't working well. The new infrastructure for digital dissemination is not working well to pay musicians. Um, you know, the, the, the commission in composition, you know, the front loading of the value of your work onto the commission and the minimizing of the downflow, you know, revenue opportunities. 
um, is, is something that, that we really have to rethink. This is not the first time it's happened, though. The move to radio, from radio to recording, you know, from live radio to recording was another time when musicians had to really work hard to figure out how to make the economic system pay. You know, so being a musician is is very precarious these days, and especially during these COVID times. I'm, I think the arts councils have done a great job as far as it goes. The government has done a you know as good a job as you can think of during the time, but it, it will really give us an opportunity to think, okay, how do we pay? How do we earn? And and how do we make that system more equitable across the board for different kinds of musicians? Um, it, it's not going to be easy. And and the privilege. I mean, I you know, I'm running the Chan Center. I see contracts for hundreds of thousands of dollars for individual musicians. There are people making a lot of money for one night's work, and I see two hundred dollars you know, for us, you know, like, I mean, we see even less, you know, so, so, I mean, it's, it, it really makes me think, how can we get to the discussion, you know, because equity of access is something that I think is, is more and more creeping in, like, why do we have these concert halls, as Ian said, if it's only rich white people who can go, like, really, it's taxpayer dollars that paid for most of those spaces. So I think we've got a lot of questions to ask ourselves about what we as a society value. But I don't feel at all shy about taking the funds, right? We pay farmers to grow things and not grow things. You know, we, we pay manufacturing companies to dump things that they've made. I mean, we do all kinds of crazy things in our economy, most of which don't make any sense to me at all as an normal person sitting in my room watching the news, you know, so it, I think that uh, we, we shouldn't be shy about assuming that there's a way to make a living as a musician. And I, I think that we can, we can ask these questions and really keep pushing the discussion. Uh, thank you. And sadly, we're almost at the end of our time. I, I would I would love to, and I know, I know I could keep speaking with everyone for hours. Um, but uh, I just want to end with something that I heard the other day at a, um, um, a session a little bit like this, but it was more BC-centric. The Stalo artist, Ronnie Harris, otherwise known as OS12, said something that I really thought was quite beautiful. And, and in a way, this goes back to the idea of, of uh, well, it relates to the idea of creating a treaty. Um, but also this, the really precarious on so many levels, precarious time that we're living in as musicians, as people, as, as um, community, all, all so Ronnie said, difficult stories need ceremony. And then he said, arts are our ceremony. And I just thought that was a really beautiful way of thinking about what we do and, and maybe even reconceptualizing and, and, and thinking about engagement in art and creativity in a, in a, in a very a reciprocal and lovely way. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that or if we should wrap up with that idea. I think it's just a beautiful sentiment to end with. Yeah, thank you so much, Pamela. Thank you, Pat, Dina, Ian and Lise. This has just been fantastic. I feel like we're, we're sort of breaking off in the middle but we could go on for hours. And I, I hope that these conversations continue to spill over into uh, each of your lives and your work and for everyone that's here listening that that's also the case. Thank you, everyone.